Greetings. I'm uh, Reverend Michael Tyun Elliston, Atlanta Soto Zen Center. This is an instructional document for the disciples of the Silent Thunder Order, um, teaching them how to lead uh, the service, chanting the Heart Sutra in English and later in Hanya Shingyo in Japanese. Um, some of the details that Matsuoka Roshi passed along to me, uh, I will comment on after the recitation. Uh, the recitation is meant to illustrate primarily the timing of the uh, chant and um, when and how the gongs are struck and so forth. So uh, we will begin chanting. This would be the point at which the doshi has come to the altar and uh, made the second incense offering. This is after the chanting of the Repentance and Refuges, which is typically typical uh, service, and returning to the mat for the doshi prostrations when the uh, doan, the person leading the chant, chants the title. So these are the three gongs that represent that transition point for the doshi returning to the mat. Yeah. 
universally to all, so that we together with all beings realize the Buddha way. and the time, all honored ones, bodhisattvas, mahasattvas, wisdom beyond wisdom, maha prajna para. So at this point, the exit bells are rung, the small bell, the doshi exits, uh, typically. Now, uh, the tempo, uh, my teacher Matsuoka Roshi described the tempo as uh, it gradually starts out very s rather slow and uh, uh, profound, uh, gradually picks up steam. It was a little faster, a little faster, until when you bring to uh, the first gong, when deeply practicing prajna, paramita, uh, clearly saw that all five aggregates, this is the five aggregates gong, at that point you should be at tempo and maintain that tempo all the way through without ever dragging or slowing down. If anything, uh, if the tempo changes, it picks up speed a little bit rushes as you go, but not too fast. If you uh, slow down, it kind of takes the air out of everybody and they sort of collapse with the uh, uh, loss of the tempo. But like uh, a bunch of horses uh, let loose, they're trying to run, go faster and faster. And so he said, it's like riding a good horse. Your job is to sort of hold it back, and hold it back. So the feeling of the tempo is one of restraining rather than pushing or controlling. It's more um, uh, holding back. Everybody's trying to go faster and faster. Um, the uh, most important parts are where you chant the title in the beginning. Uh, sensei said it's not so important if you do something wrong or out of order, but the attitude or feeling uh, with which you uh, lead the chant. Everybody feels uh, the feeling in your voice. Uh, if, you have a, if you're nervous, they'll feel your nervousness. And if you're calm, they'll feel your calmness. So for this person, the Doan, which in the uh, temple in Chicago was called the Eno because the Eno is in charge of the Zendo, and generally speaking, we would be there alone. Um, uh, when Sensei was there on a Sunday, he would be what is called the Doshi. He would be doing the bows and going to the altar, and this person would be leading the chant. In larger monasteries where you have more people, it's just, uh, up to and beyond a four-part uh, performance where one person called the Kokyo chants the title of the sutra and chants the transfer of merit, the solo parts, the doan is the one striking the gongs. A uh, fukudo, uh, it strikes the drum. So the drum it usually would be on the other side of the altar and another person is striking the drum. Uh, so including the doshi, that makes four people. But uh, Matsuoka Roshi trained us to do this alone because he knew that we would be basically 
uh, opening his in-center and opening the doors and there by ourselves. So, um, let's see. Details uh, beyond that, uh, when you get to the end, the timing is also important, uh, especially in the Japanese, when you're chanting the merit transfer. Uh, may this merit extend universally to all so that we together with all beings realize the Buddha way. There's been a pause here after gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhisvaha, everything comes to an end. Then uh, the kokyo, or in this case the doan, chants this uh, transfer of merit. And again, that's a point at which you're solo, people are hearing your voice, so it's important that that be done with uh, kind of a gravity or um, dignity. Um, everybody has different uh, voice, and different abilities, so uh, we shouldn't uh, strive too hard, too hard at this. Then the uh, continuing the universal transfer of merit, all Buddhas throughout space and time, this is the bells, and uh, bells are very important here. The sound of the bell is important, and uh, Matsuoka Roshi pointed out some uh, details about how to do this. The striking mallet is covered with uh, like a chamois leather, uh, maybe covered with other things. The, the ones I've seen covered essentially the same. There's an overlap area here of about half an inch where the leather overlaps, and that is the thickest part of the covering. So this is the side with which we turn to the gong and strike the gong. The striker is positioned so that the edge of the gong is at the halfway point of the leather between the end and the handle. Uh, the gong, this striker is set against the gong in this way uh, and when striking uh, it's not a rim shot, it's not tipped like so and it's flat against the uh, slope of the gong. Then it's raised off in a rolling motion like so as if it were going to say dive over and go into the, into the gong sort of a rolling motion like that, and it falls of its own weight. The stick is quite heavy, and uh, our grip on it is not tight, but, but very loose. And the stick falls of its own weight and strikes the gong of its own weight, and we lift it away. So it's, uh, the stick is actually doing the striking, not the person. So again, uh, it's at rest, uh, in the beginning, not for every gong, but in the beginning when you're getting ready to strike, and you're chanting and perhaps paying attention to the doshi and chanting, rest the stick against the gong so you can feel it and you don't have to look at it. Then it comes off and it rolls and lifts away. So it's as if we're lifting or pulling the sound out of the gong by this motion. Then it stays here until the next gong, which comes along with five aggregates, as we said before. Same kind of motion. And if you hear the listen to the gong, uh, we suggest at this point, and beforehand, you're sitting waiting uh, in gasho with the stick resting in the uh, thumbs. In this way, uh, you compose yourself. It's good for you to be sitting in place before the others arrive so that you have time for zazen, sitting here, so that by the time you begin leading the chant, you are uh, calm, clear, uh, sitting and breathing for some time, uh, and have overcome any nervousness that you might feel the first of the time, first few times you do this especially. And the, when you let go of the stick, it sort of ro rolls itself down into the hand, and you transfer it, and we were taught to put the one hand in gasho, resting it against the gong and waiting for the time for the first gong. Uh, many people don't don't do this, but this was Matsuoka's teaching. So here's the first gong. Comes back, a bow, and when bowing, you let the sound enter your head, enter your ear, of course, and you feel it in entering your body, so that your body begins to vibrate in harmony with the gong in the thorax region here. Then uh, you can begin humming at a low pitch in harmony with the gong, so that your voice is now tuning itself to the frequency of the gong. So just as the stick is doing the work, 
the gong is now taking over and we're tuning ourselves into the gong, the third gong. And then the stop is slightly off, that is first the gong and then the drum, resting the stick on the drum, then pushing in here it has a kind of a vibration like zot pock. This is not a hard hit, this is again just lifting the stick and letting it fall catching it so that we stop it. So in each case the stick is doing the work. Now you can choke up on this stick or you can hold it you know far back at the end. In this case it's too heavy, in this case it's too light. So the position of the right hand, I'm, I'm right handed so I strike the drum with the right hand. If you're left handed you can reverse these two positions. Uh, is to uh, find that point where it's like an extension of the arm and it's very easy to lift and drop and then the stick itself is doing the striking you're simply catching it so that it doesn't do a double bounce catching it like so uh, when you have more people and it's a fukudo another person doing the drum it's a two-handed hold and so the arms naturally go this way it makes kind of a circle pushing away from from you so what we're doing one-handed is we're kind of replicating that form. So it's not simply a matter of lifting up and straight up and down. It's kind of a rotation, like so. The sweet spot on the drum is right here on top, being carved out of the grain, so that this is the most resonant point. If you move off of that spot, it'll sound differently. And if you listen carefully, you can hear uh, when it's right on the sweet spot. So again, you don't have to be watching it. I typically turn the stitch on the mallet uh, to the top so that I'm always striking with the same part of the mallet. So this be in the beginning it's very slow. the Japanese, Matsuoka Roshi encouraged us to do it more slowly because people are less familiar with the language. And if you start off right away and go very quickly, you sort of leave everybody behind. So the reason for going slowly in the beginning and gradually picking up steam is so that everybody is sort of with you and catches up with you and continues, continues with you. So this uh, is a matter of something you can practice uh, to have this become natural for you. Very simple motion, should not be exaggerated, should not be too much effort. And it's loose, just as this, uh, this is held loosely, uh, like holding a bird, not too tight, not too loose. Um, let's see, what else about these sticks? Oh, when it comes to the end and we stop it, then you press down with your thumb to stop it. But otherwise, you're simply catching it, catching it in your hand. Now when you're practicing uh, alone, uh, just as when you're practicing piano, you practice one hand, the right hand, then you practice the left hand, and then you practice the two together. So that what happens often is when people uh, practice, are, are first doing this, they'll be going along when it comes time to strike the gong. When we practicing prajna, will stop and, and let them strike the gong. So chanting deeply practicing Prajna Paramit clearly saw that all five aggregates are empty. No gong. And then practice also chanting uh, clearly saw that all five aggregates are empty. If you go through the sutra that way, 
getting the left hand coordinated with the champion, the right hand coordinated with the champion, then it's much easier to put the two together. The striking of the small gong is similar to the large gong. It can be struck this same way with the uh, upward orientation of the stick, exactly as we struck this gong, but of course it's much lighter stick, smaller gong. So uh, again, the weight of the stick is striking the gong, it's proportional to the gong. The other way to do it, and the more f usually done because this gong is sitting rather low and sometimes even on the floor, is to uh, drop the stick into the gong, again halfway on the leather. And it's kind of like stirring a cup of coffee. Um, resting the stick against the gong when, when it's coming up so that, you, again, you don't have to look. You can follow the chanting. Prajna paramita the mantra that says gatte gatte para gatte parasam gatte bodhisvaha. The stick is hanging in our hand loosely, just as we are holding the other sticks. When it comes time to strike the gong, instead of striking down with the stick, we raise the stick and let it fall of its own weight, again catching it and lifting it away from the rim so that that sound becomes the sound of the weight of the stick striking the bone. So these are the, this is the same method of striking the gong when we're doing prostration bows. Those are two, and the third one would be and when the knees hit the mat or the forehead, second one. In some cases we call for stopping the gong but uh, it's perfectly uh, fine to let it continue to ring. Let's see, what else was important? I think that about covers uh, most of those details. So any questions? Anyone have any questions? Afterward, you want to put everything back where it was, of course, leave no traces. So next we will go on to the Hanya Shinja, or the same sutra in Japanese. Greetings again. So now we will chant the Hanya Shingyo. It's the uh, Sino-Japanese uh, version of the Great Heart Wisdom Sutra. Again, this is where the doshi has come to the altar for the second time, offered incense, and steps back to return to the mat when the first drunk gong is struck.
So the last three bells were the doshi and the prostration bells, everybody joining. Ordinarily when the doshi does uh, bows, if they are silent, that is no bell, then nobody's joining. This is when the doshi is uh, entering before the jundo in the morning. And uh, any time closing the jundo, if the doshi comes through the bows, then we ring the three bells, this is when we roll down three bells, this is inviting everyone to join. Now some points about the Hanya Shingyo, Maka Hanya Haramita, Hanya Haramita is Japanese pronunciation, Prajna Paramita, Shingyo Sutra, Maka is great. Uh, all of the syllables, that is the vowels, are pronounced uh, with great uh, constancy. A is always pronounced A, I is a short I, E. And O is always pronounced uh, kind of a long O. Uh, uh, mote, 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 where there's a double uh, consonant, such as in mote, there's a little bit of a stop there, mote, an emphasis. Isayini, isai, two S's there, isayini, oyo bosho. E is pronounced e, as in warera, warera, close to an a sound. And uh, u's at the end of a word and uh, i at the end of a word are often uh, silent or semi-silent, like um, charishi, re shoho kuso fusho fu metsu, metsu, not metsu. Uh, Buddha in Japanese says butsu, but it's butsu, uh, just as the rakusu is rakusu. So the U's are silent often. Uh, the pronunciation is not important unless in a Japanese community. But the timing is, is very important. Uh, Matsuoka Roshi was very big on the timing, especially at the end where we do the fueko, or transfer of merit. Negawa kuwa kono kudoku o mote amane kui saini oyo boshi. Kind of dragged out there. Then, warera to shujo tomi na tomoni butsuro ho jozen koto o. And the gong is hit about halfway o up, halfway up. 
Ji Ho San Shi is very, very slow. Ji Ho San Shi Shi Fu Shi Son Bu Sa Mo Ko Sa Mo Ko Ho Ja stretches out to the end into the silence and then in the silence we hear the bones or the bows. I think that's probably about all I can uh, remember or have to comment about this particular one. In the comments that Matsuoka Roshi gave me. But uh, again he said it was the way we do it the feeling with which we do it is more important than whether we do it accurately or correctly. So if you lose your place, uh, just try to catch up. The person doing the uh, chanting, leading the chant, the drum and gong, has a lot to do. And so um, it's not necessary that you chant every syllable of every phrase, uh, especially once you get going, because everybody else is chanting, but especially on the title, where people can feel how you're beginning, and especially at the end where you do the solo voice. This is where you want to focus your attention on pronunciation and timing in particular, because this is what conveys the feeling of the sutra chant to, to the uh, sangha. So uh, hopefully there will be more uh, tapes coming in the instructional series, but this is a very basic thing that all disciples need to learn to do. So I hope that you can practice with this and uh, from time to time rever review it with the practice leader or with myself. And especially before you go uh, lead the sutra for the public, say on a public day at the temple, uh, make sure that you rehearsed it and that you have uh, gone through it with your teacher so that <coughs> uh, there's really no embarrassment in this <laughs> so, so that you don't embarrass yourself <laughs> in front of the uh, Sangha. But uh, we must be able to make mistakes or else we cannot improve.